everyone this is kumar sanju and i warmly welcome you all in my youtube channel study point dilse today here we are going to discuss uh, on a important work that is an apology for poetry this particular work was produced by sir philip sidney in 1595 and before starting the explanation of this particular work we will also have a discussion about his uh, biography Sir Philip Sidney was born in 1554 and died on 1595. He was a poet writer, poet and along with he was also a critic and he belongs to the Elizabethan age. You know dear friends this work was written in response to the work of Stephen Gosens the abuse the school of abuse. The School of Abuse uh, work was produced by Stephen Gosen in 1570 and through this work you know Stephen Gosen blamed to the poetry along with to the poet so many defamatory words were used in his particular work the main reason behind to produce that work the School of Abuse was that the Stephen Gosen wants to get the name and fame in his early age when he wrote this particular tretais he was just 24 years but dear students as we know sometime it happens that whatever we desire we didn't get we don't get the same thing happened with stephen gosen stephen gosen when he thought that after the publication of this particular work i will earn name and fame but it couldn't be happened that time but it doesn't mean that uh, during the elizabethan is only these two works were produced like stephen gosen abuse of school and another one was an apology for poetry another works were also there like uh, roger sm also composed also wrote that work taxophilus as you can see it on your screen which were produced in 1545 and in this work roger sm advocated only the use of english he said that one should avoid the foreign words into english language and another in his work schoolmasters which was produced in 1570 he clearly shows his affinity with the miso mosui miso mosui means we can say poet haters of the time in simple words if we talk about roger assam said that those poet, those people who used to hate poets So regarding in defense of the poet in his school masters the roger sm coined the word mesomosi which literal meaning is poet hater so it was also a traitorize it was also written in defense of poets but to compose at a defense of poetry was a big reason as i have earlier told because he not only condemned because stephen gosen not only condemned to the poetry but also to the poets on a high scale that's why that's why sir philip sidney wrote his treatise in response to the the school of abuse so let's read out what is there as you can see it on your screen Sidney's an apology for poetry is a class of its own altogether work altogether different from these critics it was first published posthumously 1595 posthumously means after his death this work could be get published so when this work was published it was separated into two titles by the two different editors so one was william pons by was called the defense of poetry and another one an apology for poetry the title was given or brought out by henry olney so two thing we have to keep remember when this work was published in 1595 by the two different editors the two different names were given to it first one was defense of poetry that was given by william pons by pons by another one was apology for poetry this title or a name was given by henry olney so this was the basic things about this now let's we will move ahead towards the background and what we will read in this particular treatise we will discuss 
as you can see it on your screen it's given here in this unit unit we are going to learn sydney's defense and gosen's abuse what were the defenses given by sydney and what were the abuses which were did by gosen so sydney's apology for poetry sydney's view of the antiquity and the universal universality of poetry sally's uh, sydney's definition of poetry and poetry as a superior superior to history and philosophy another the various kinds of poetry four chief objections to poetry and sydney's reviews of english poetry and drama so all these things we are going to discuss in this particular critical treatise so let's move ahead friends as you can see it on your screen historical background we are going to discuss what was the main purpose why as our little we have discussed in a very nutshell here we will discuss in detail what was the main reason to wrote this particular treatise so the immediate cause of sydney's writing the essay was stephen gosens the school of abuse which was brought brought out in 1579 and which was unauthorized dedicated to sydney and question the morality of poetry as earlier we have talked about that stephen gosens the school of abuse which was brought in 1579 it was an unauthorized dedicated to sydney in which you know he questions on the morality of the poetry so we can see here another one also was another one also critics were there like thomas law's defense of poetry but here we are talking about sydney's apology for poetry so sydney wrote apology is a much more than a reply to gosen he proceeds to give an argument for the value of poetry and its significance also so now let's see what gosen said gosen was essentially guided or misguided by the spirit of sore puritanism actually that time you know gosen was highly misguided by the spirit of puritanism during that puritan time he was misguided he you know uh, brought out a few indeed a bad mis uh, misconceptions in his mind and that's why he wrote like this he has described his work as a pleasant invective pleasant invective means nothing but invective means we can say which we when we see uh, say something in a very bad manners that is called invective but here he said it's a pleasant invective means हिंदी में हम लोग बोलते हैं तारीफ में गाली देना वही चीज़ है सो ही थॉट दैट द पीपल विल रीड आउट लाइक अ प्लेजेंट इन्वेक्टिव बट वॉट हैपन्स हाउ वर द रीडर्स हैव एन अनप्लेजेंट एक्सपीरियंस वाइल रीडिंग इट वैन द पीपल रीड आउट दिस पार्टिकुलर ट्रेटाइज दे फाइंड इट वेरी अनप्लेजेंट एंड द जनरल फीलिंग्स ऑफ हिज को द जनरल फीलिंग्स इज ऑफ कोर्सनेस एज द एंटायर एस इज फुल ऑफ क्लैप ट्रैप एक्सप्रेशन एंड पोएट्स आर द वेट स्टोन्स ऑफ वेट you know when the readers read out this question that i they find out it has totally coarseness and he also said to the poets poets are the wet stones of wit you know these particular points we have to keep remember in our mind these things became important our exam points of view because in exam they will ask who said poets are the wet stones of wit then we have to give response that is gosen and that wit is rarely brought where honey and gall are mixed it will be hard to sever that one from other so when gosen wrote this essay he was just 24 and he wanted instant fame and instead he became infamous earlier as in the beginning in the very beginning we have discussed that the main purpose to wrote this treatise was that he want to get fame in his early age but it becomes opposite in place of his instant fame he became infamous so he suffered a lot so now let's move ahead what stephen gosen said in his work the school of abuse the full title of gosen's work is the school of abuse containing a pleasant invective against poets he calls poets here piper players jesters and such like a caterpillars of commonwealth setting up the flag of defiance to their mischief exercise and overthrowing their work war by profan writers so friends here as you can see it that 
very derogatory, very defamatory words were used by Stephen Grossin in his work, The School of Abuse. He called the poets pipers, players, jesters, caterpillars of commonwealth, you know, and setting up uh, the flags of defiance to their mischief exercise and overthrowing their work worn by profane writers. I mean, such words, such very derogatory words were used by Stephen Grossin. So, you know, this thing irritated Sir Philip Sidney and he wrote his this particular treatise. So let's move ahead. So here first we can see Sidney's apology for poetry as we have seen in our index in our unit what we will discuss here. So what was the apology for poetry and what Sidney said let's see. Only we will discuss here most important things. You can see here among the Roman a poet was called Bates and which is as much as diviner for seer or a prophet. You know, in Roman, the poets were used to call bets. This thing we have to keep remember. If anyone is asking, bets stands for, so you have to respond there. It's a Roman, it's a poet. Because in Roman, words used to be called. And in Roman, poets are regarded as a diviner, for seer and prophet. Okay. So the Greek called him a poet. And which name hath the most excellent gone through the other language? It comes of this word poin, which is to make. Another one is there from which the word poet was coined, that is poin, which means to make. So, poin word is also, also can be asked if someone is asking what is the mean of poin, so you can mention there to make. So, in simple word, when in Roman, poets were you know regarded as a divine power, have a divine power by which they can tell they can make a prophecy about the future so such personality how a man can call caterpillars player gestures you know so here he is trying to explain he is trying to defend the poets by using by giving these examples so you know in his in this treatise sir philip sydney taken out the examples homer tasso shakespeare means Nearby his writers, he has taken out the great author's examples here to establish, to prove his words. Another one was there, you can see here. According to Sydney, all other human arts are subordinate to nature poetry and poetry alone transcends nature since the poet is a maker. You know, one thing we have to keep remember, Sir Flame Sydney said that poetry alone transcends nature. Poetry has a transcendental power. Transcendent means which we can change anything into a maripool or jolly things. A transcendental means which we can see about the future. We can make a prophecy about the future. That is called transcendental power. So this power is having only with poetry. And as earlier in Greek, in Greek mythology, Vates were called the poet. And who were nearer to the God, diviner, foreseer, and prophet. So he said, and since the poet is a maker. So Sally's defense of poetry is inspired by Sydney's apology for poetry. As the same work, you know, Sally's defense for poetry, defense of poetry was also written in response to the Thomas Le Peacock's Four Ages of Poetry. And in another video, we will also discuss Sally's defense of poetry. So in order to have a better understanding, we can refer to Sally's comment in this context if here we will discuss the shallies that particular context then we will understand then what is the poet and by which you know we will be able to understand the justification of Sydney which he has given here he says none deserves the name of creator but the God and the poet Shelley has directly said in his work defense of poetry that none deserve the name of creator Creator can be only two person, either may be God or the poet. As the God and create as the God creator creates his own universe, the poet too has his own world. As the God creates his world, in the same way poet also creates his own world. So to attack poetry is to attack roots of culture, and to attack poetry is to attack the universality of poetry itself. Here is justified if you are attacking. On a poetry, it means you are attacking the roots of culture and even you are attacking the universality of the poetry. 
and another one we will moving ahead towards next unit what he has given the definition of poetry according to sir philip sidney poetry therefore is an art of imitation for so aristotle termed it in his words memses if you have read out the work of aristotle poetics that you will find out the poetry is a imitation in place of imitation he used the word memesis memesis means imitation also so in the same way as aristotle said in his work poetics here sir philip sidney also said that poetry is nothing but is an art of imitation and that is to say a representing counterfeiting or a figure forth to speak metaphorically a speaking picture with this end to teach and to delight in simple words sidney said the first poetry is an imitation the main work of poetry is to teach and delight and poetry is a speaking picture so what word we have to keep remember here whenever such type of question is being asked it can be asked that sir philip sidney make the comparison of poetry with a speaking picture talking picture like this to so speaking picture and he said poetry is an imitation right poetry has a power to teach and along with delight these things we have to minute things we have to keep remember another another definition we will see here poetry is an imitation art of imitation and its chief function is to teach and delight imitation doesn't mean mere copying or reproduction reproduction of fact it means representing or transmuting of the real and actual poet has clarified as he earlier said that poetry is poetry is an art of imitation art of imitation it doesn't mean that it will make a copy or reproducing a fact reproducing means as earlier any thing has been produced again that should be produced that is called reproduction so here he said the poetry is nothing but mere copying or reproducing the fact it means it should be represent it should transmute the real and actual thing whatever the actual things are there whatever the real things are there that should be presented that should be represented and sometime creating something entirely new and sometime poetry has a capacity poetry has a capability to produce something new and unique things so this definition was given by philip sidney as earlier we have also seen he said that sidney speaks of poetry as a speaking picture a speaking picture we have to keep remember this thing can be important in exam in exam it can also be asked so he said poetry is nothing but a speaking picture another one you know here sidney has given the different definition of the different types of poetry so you can see here sidney then goes on to classify different kinds of poetry like sacred poetry philosophical or didactic poetry and the right kind of poetry so we have to keep remember here he has given clarification the four kinds of poetry one is sacred poetry philosophical or didactic poetry and the right kind of poetry so what he said what the different types of classification said let's understand the poet who writes sacred poetry the teacher of religion and prophets are essentially theologists hence they have their own limitation and the philosophical or didactic poets are restricted within their own boundary so first one we will understand those who are writing sacred poetry they may be teacher of religion or prophet are essentially theologists especially theologists prophets and teachers used to write used to write it with the sacred poetry and another one is their philosophical or didactic poetry this type of this type of poetry has some restriction and it has their own boundaries as they are dependent for their material or external sources because they dependent on material and external sources material and ext external sources means nothing but by which they can prove their arguments they can give the examples to prove their ideas that's why philosophical and didactic poetry are restricted and have a boundaries which they cannot cross if they are producing any ideas they must have to give their valid arguments so he draws special attention to the third group of poets the third group of poets are the real makers as shelley says the unacknowledged legislature of the world the third type of when he 
talking about the third type of poetry that is the right kind of poetry here he talks about the poet and poets are the real makers as sally has said in defense of poetry then unacknowledged legislature of the world unacknowledged means which is not verified right verified legislature means we can say to create the rules so in simple words we can say poets are the real makers of their universe their rules their own rules and regulation they can create their own world according to shelley so here we have to keep remember two thing sacred poetry sacred poetry belong to the theologist and philosophical directive poetry have few limitations they are dependent on material and externals but the real makers if we talk about that is only poets okay it can be asked if what is the main of real makers by sydney then you must have an answer it's a poets okay another one sydney makes poetry free from any kind of external limitation and here he has given his argument as we have seen that uh, for sacred poetry there are limitations for philosophical directive poets there are also few limitations but if we talk about here for poets sydney makes the poetry free from any kind of external limitations like meter metrical pattern like rhyming like other things so it's not a rhyming and verse that makes the poet no more than a large gown makes an advocate this definition we have to keep remember this definition became important because here he is proving his ideas here is giving his uh, valid argument he said because poetry is free for poetry there is no any kind of limit limitations like metrical or rhyme or another thing he said it's not a rhyming and verse that makes the poet rhyme and verse doesn't make a poet as a large gown makes an advocate advocate those who are wearing a large gown they only regarded a poet they only regarded as an advocate sorry for correction they only regarded as a poet, advocate if they will not wear that the large gown they will not be regarded as an advocate it doesn't mean poetry is also a valid poetry is free from all kind of external limitation whether it has a rhyme whether it is a verse or not in the same way whether the advocate is wearing the large gown or not he will be treated as a advocate so verse is the outer skin and not the flesh and blood of poetry as earlier it has been clarified that if advocate is wearing his large gown or not wearing large gown large gown it doesn't mean that he will not be called advocate he will be advocate but only for outer look for giving uh, for uh, making attraction for uh, drawing at attraction towards a particular person outer skin becomes important so he said here the verse is the outer skin not flesh and blood verses rhymes they are all things are outer skin for poetry this have a no need and these are not like a flesh and blood of poetry flesh and blood means the main important part important part is that your emotions your feelings your ideas which you are organizing in proper way which which you are putting your ideas in that poem and why those ideas what you want to produce what you want to convey the masses to the society right that becomes important so words and rhyme they are only out of skin they are not internal part so we should remember that verse is just an ornament and not an essential of to poetry we have to keep remember who said the verse are just like an ornament they are not an essential part of poetry then you must have an answer it should be sir philip sidney so only this much for today session and the remaining we will brought out in different different our videos and parts so till bye bye take care i hope you will understand it will be beneficial for you and for your exam if you like my video kindly comment like and share thank you